GLC presents Brought to you by the donations of our faithful partners Hi, are you in a situation where you're having to choose some people to be leaders to help you do what you think God wants you to do? That's what we're going to talk about today. If you've watched these TV shows a lot, you can tell that I have about five areas that I teach from. I teach from leadership, uh, discipleship, signs and wonders, relationships. I teach about men and women of the Bible and how you can relate to them because what they went through is what you go through. But today, we're concentrating on leadership. And let's just think about it. In a business, in a ministry, in anything you're trying to do, you cannot do it by yourself. Now, there's a certain level you really can do by yourself. You, you, uh, if you have a lot of talents and you're a hard worker and you have great vision, you can start out all by yourself. But sooner or later, if it starts to grow, you've got to have somebody come and help you. And it needs to be somebody that you can trust, that you can rely on, and that you know can do the things you can no longer do. Sometimes uh, a little piece of wisdom you need to think about is play to your strengths and play to your weaknesses. What I mean by that? Well, playing to your strengths means you do what you do well. A little guideline along with playing to your strengths is only do what only you can do. And if someone else can do it, let them do it. That frees you up. Otherwise, you're too busy trying to get too much cover. The waterfront is too wide. You're having to cover just too many things. And it stresses you out. It wears you out. It, it stretches you too thin. And you're really not as effective. So playing to your strengths means you do what you do well. You do what God specifically told you to do, called you to do. Playing to your weaknesses. Well, what's that about? That's about realizing what you're really just not good at. Sometimes people tend to think that that's an inferior thing, to have to admit, I'm not good with money. I'm not good with details. I'm not good at talking to people. I'm not good at seeing what needs to be done. I'm not good at seeing what needs to be done in the future. You know, the real truth is God doesn't want you to get all the glory. He wants to get all the glory in the project that you're doing. And so, uh, as you're going along, setting your plan into motion, you need to be thinking about those things. You need to be thinking about, who do I need to help me? What do I need? Now, you know as well as I do, the hard thing can be finding the right person for the job. People gave me a lot of advice when I was starting uh, women's ministry. I went to leaders, known leaders, and I said to them, can, what's the one piece of advice you can give me that I won't have to go through the trenches and go through all the mistakes and find out how to know that? Oh, they were just so willing to share, just great things. But one man looked at me and he said, Betty, I know for sure I can tell you this. It is so important to have the right person in the job that even if you have to wait a little bit, and even if you have to suffer a little bit because you're having to do without, it's better than getting the wrong person. Another person came to me, and, and I was telling this woman what he had said. She was a leader, and she said, Oh, he is so right, because it is hard to get them out, and it's better to do without until you know it's the right person. I've really had trouble with this. Um, in playing to my weaknesses, I don't mind getting people to help me. I'm, I'm, a, I'm really, I'm a pretty good delegator. I just don't have a problem with that. Yet, I tend to make the mistake of picking someone because I like them or because I just want to help them grow in the Lord or I want them to, I see where they are, I see what they could be, and I, I just want to give them a chance. 
But I can tell you what she said is right. I've had times that I just had to pray and say, Lord, you got to help me. I have put the wrong person in this job and it's causing problems and she's causing problems or he's causing problems. Help. And watched how the Lord, just by talking to the Lord, he moved people out. And he can do it in such a way that you don't have big conflict. He can just make it happen. One day they're there, the next day, what do you know? Something came along and they're gone. You will hear people say, there's just an absence of good leaders today. No, there isn't. There'll always be good leaders. That's God's job, is to raise people up, equip people, train them, and there'll always be good leaders. You just need to know how to find them. See, the thing about people who are raising up, being raised up in leadership is that they're in various stages of development. And they're at maybe one level of what you're doing in your business, you, you can handle one type of person. Then, if your business gets bigger, no matter how good a job they did, it's time to pick someone who has more experience, more training, been under pressure more, knows how to deal with it, and you just have to uh, pick someone, a completely different person. So as you go through these stages, there will be leaders that you look for where you are now, and then there'll be leaders that you look for as your business grows or your ministry grows and what all of that is. Now, does God have guidelines for picking people? He does, and you, if you know the Bible, and you know the Bible stories, then you know this verse. Look at, look at this verse, this first scripture. 1 Samuel 16, 7. But God told Samuel, looks aren't everything. Don't be impressed with his looks and stature. I've already eliminated him. God judges people differently than humans do. Men and women look at the face. God looks into the heart. So if you know the King James Version, it's man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. Now what was going on there? Oh, this is when Samuel was told by the Lord to go and anoint the man who was to be the next king after Saul. And he told him to go to the house of Jesse. So he goes and he looks at all and he says, let me see all your sons. God has told me to pick a man and so the first brother comes out, and he just looks great. He's just tall. He's, he's probably handsome, just got a big, great look about him. God says, nope. Next guy, nope. Next guy, nope. Remember this verse I read said, I've already eliminated him. And you know God will put it in your heart. That's what he'll do with you. You don't have to think. I am out here by myself trying to pick these people God wants me to pick, and how am I going to pick them? Because the Holy Spirit will give you peace. He will let you know some way, this is the person I've chosen. There'll be a way. And it won't be some kind of supernatural, spooky way. It can be very common sense, very ordinary, just somebody giving you a recommendation. But sometimes it's in your spirit and you just have a peace or a knowing, this is the one. And so when David came, Samuel had uh, said to Jesse, is this all your sons? And he said, oh yeah, well, yeah, but we've got this young one. He's out in the fields. He said, bring him in. And when he came in, he knew this is God's man. And he anointed him to be the king. Wow, what a big thing. Now look at these pictures right here. Here's a man thinking about choosing the right man for the job. Look at this woman, choosing the right woman. Do you see how they stand out from the crowd? It's really that way. You know, even in a crowd of leaders, the one you need still will stand out. God's going to be faithful to you. If you're doing it in your business, he wants you to have a very successful business. If you're doing it in your ministry, he wants you to have a very successful ministry. He's going to guide you. And we're going to look at these guidelines. Choosing the right person is going to be based on quite a few things. 
One is past performance. Now, this doesn't mean this person comes to you and says, I did this, and I did that, and I did this, and I did that, and so I would be good. No, uh, you need to find out from other people what was their past performance. I made a mistake one time, actually pretty recently, in taking people to Africa with me, and I picked someone too hastily based on what all she told me she could do. And then I didn't even check it out. I mean, I'm just telling you a mistake I made. I was just so eager to take people with me and give them a chance to go, and she was nice and friendly, but I didn't know her very well. And I had to go on what she said. Well, when we got there, the deal was she had a big ego. She was pretty sold on herself. She talked about herself a lot. But she didn't do the kind of job I needed done. What is the person's past reputation with the people who have worked with him? You can find that out. What's that person's past reputation in the community? You know, his reputation either tarnishes your reputation or enhances your reputation. So as you talk to people, what are the things that you really need to ask about? It depends on what you need this person for. For instance, if you have a job that you need someone for and there's a tremendous amount of pressure in this job, then one thing you want to ask people is, how well do they perform under pressure? If it's a job that has a lot of deadlines, then you need to find out how well do they do with their task. Do they get it done quickly and efficiently? If it's a job that involves working with the public, then how do they get along with people? And one thing you need to find out in that is in situations where conflict has arisen, how well did they do that? How well did they handle it? And then you need to ask yourself, what do you see in this person? Do you see things about them that you can instinctively tell, I think this is what I'm looking for. But probably the most important thing, and it's just common sense, what do you need him to do? Is he the best one for the job? That's what you need to ask the Lord. I, I have really prayed a lot, and I have made mistakes, and you're going to make mistakes. But God's still going to be faithful to you. As I told you, you can say, Lord, I picked the wrong one. Please remove them and let it be done in a way that it doesn't cause a lot of strife and conflict and anger. He can do that. You, you just need to be thinking about what, what kind of a ministry do you really want to have? What do you want the hallmark of it to be? I want to tell you something. A man who was not a Christian... I don't know if he was ungodly or not. I read his book. I know he certainly wasn't a, uh, anybody you would think would be a Christian. Good guy, but not a Christian. He lived in Minneapolis. And in this book that he was writing about dealing with people in business and how to get ahead, how to be sure yours succeeds, he began to talk about the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, which is based in Minneapolis. And in this book, he said something that made a big impression on me. He said, you know, I'm really not caught up in religion or anything like that, but I'll tell you one thing. I'm in the envelope business, and they need envelopes in that ministry. They need all kinds of paperwork. And when I do something for them, their check is in the mail to me before I've even sent them the bill. And that was such a little tiny thing to say. But right there, whoever was in charge of the money with the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association somehow fit into Billy Graham's plan of how we're going to do business. And that person got that money like it needed to go. So that's what I'm talking about. You've got to have people in every aspect of your business that you, could, you don't have to worry about are they doing their job. They're doing it better than you could do it. You see, when you're raising up leaders, if you're not careful, you can begin to feel like, well, I can't let anybody pass me. I'm the leader. No, that's really not the way to be it. The sign of a good teacher 
is the pupil passes you. You say, well, yeah, but I want to do what God called me to do, and I want to do, I want to do it right, and I want it to succeed. Yeah, that's fine. It's just that as you raise these people up and you give them support and help and verbal encouragement, then they're going to blossom, and they are going to pass you in certain ways and just rejoice with them. You don't have to feel threatened. And I see people feel threatened by that, and so they squash people down. They don't say, what has God called you to do, and how can I help you do it? And when they can tell it's time for a person to move on, the job has gotten too small for them. Instead of keeping them squashed down, they say to them, you know, I think this job is too small for you now. I believe you've outgrown it. What's in your heart? Let's pray. Let me help you. And then you begin to look for someone else. Well, you might think, oh, great. Now I've got to start all over again and find somebody else. No. You see, God's got a person waiting for you. He'll always have people waiting to help you. And when it's the right time, they will appear. So don't make the mistake of grabbing someone to get a job done that you need done so desperately. The church that I'm in has had a philosophy for over 30 years. We are not a needs-based needs church. We are a gifts-based church. Now, what is that? That's kind of hard to say, but what do I mean by that? Well, they didn't say, we need somebody to work in the nursery. Will you do it? We need somebody to take care of this Sunday school class. Will you do it? They didn't, they've never done it that way. Instead, they've looked for the gifts in people to help them recognize what they're good at, what they're gifted at, and then pointedly put them in places where they could flourish. If you want a business full of happy people, if you want a ministry full of people who feel satisfied, excited, and motivated, then you put people where their giftings lead them. Well, how are you going to find that out, especially in Christian work? Well, the, did you know there's a lot of tests on the Internet on spiritual gifts, and you can just Google spiritual gifts, and you'll see those tests, and you can print them off and give them to people. It helps people to see, even in business, if they have leadership like administrative qualities or... Uh, merciful qualities where they'd be a real good counselor. You can check those tests out. They have personality tests on the internet. So see, you don't have to buy books. If you live in a country that you're watching this show and you say, well, we don't have those kind of books, get on the internet. It's all on the internet. So when you're looking for someone to fill a job, looking for a leader, it's going to be based on three things. Personality, talents, and giftings. And remember, God's looking on their heart at all times. And he's already begun to prepare them, not just you. He's, got, he's begun to prepare them to get ready. Well, I'll tell you something I do. Uh, as my ministry grows and grows, I have to have more and more people come and help me. And when I can see that a job that I'm going to be needing is coming up soon, I begin to pray and say, Lord, Lead me to the person and begin to get them ready. Begin to speak to them, Lord. Begin to talk to them and, and tell them something's coming. Or begin to put a desire in their heart to serve you, Lord, in a ministry so that when I talk to them, they're very open to it. We're going to look at another scripture right now. This is 1 Timothy 5.22. It says, lay hands on no man suddenly. Or, in the Message Bible, it says this. Don't appoint people to church leadership positions too hastily. If a person is involved in some serious sins, you don't want to become an unwitting accomplice. So you see, character and what people have inside them is even more important than that. Uh, I heard a man say one time, I would rather hire somebody who has the character and the integrity and work with them and train them to do the job I need done more than I would rather hire somebody with extremely strong talent in an area and no character and no integrity. 
You see, integrity will hold a person up when things get difficult. Integrity will hold a person up when temptations come. Uh, integrity will hold a person up when there's strife, when there's um, difficulties in learning the job and people would like to quit, when uh, unexpected situations occur, and I mean completely unexpected, then problems are going to rise. And yet, if you have picked a person with strong character, then even if they would like to quit, they won't quit. Especially if they've gone to the Lord and they know the Lord called them to the job. So here we go. I'm going to give you some just some little guidelines, and you might want to write these down. Just some more requirements that a leader would have to have. The first one is faithful and committed to you. You don't want somebody behind your back talking, spreading strife. In fact, there's a Bible verse that says, drive out the mocker and strife will cease. So as a leader, you've got to be able to do that. And as you bring leaders on and they have people under them, they're going to have to be able to do it. Because in a business, I just hear the Lord saying right now, there's somebody watching this that in your business, you can't figure out what's going on. But there's a lot of strife going on. And you, you can't seem to solve it. And this is the Lord's word to you. Who is the person causing the problem? You need to get rid of them. And when you do, peace will come back. The next thing is, and how do people do with their smaller responsibilities? And I talked about that a little bit, but were they involved or did they keep passing off their own job that they should have been doing, but they passed it off to somebody else? I heard about another story about a man that got, uh, went to work for a company, got a huge salary, huge. He never worked. And they began to notice he kept passing off all of his duties to other people saying that he had to be the thinking one, the one watching over it, but he never did work. So how did they really do in smaller responsibilities? And sometimes it's hard to find these things out, but truth always comes out eventually. Here's another one. Are they able to hold things in confidence? You have to know who you can trust to share things with because it's too big a burden to carry it by yourself. And there's, it's always wise to have counselors around you that can advise you. So are they able to keep things in confidence? The next thing is, how knowledgeable are they of God's word and God's principles? You see, you can know, say, oh, yeah, I read the Bible. Sure, mm -hmm, I've read the Bible. No, how much do you know it? And how much do you know the principles of it? You see, you, can't, you can maybe know 39 verses that you can quote. But do you know God's principles? How, how he would want you to act in a situation? Not everything, of course, is spelled out in the Bible. Not every situation is. But God's principles are spelled out. And when you get in a situation that there's not anything in the Bible that specifically tells you what to do, if you have a person that knows God's word and knows God's principles, then they can see what to do. Do they have a proven walk with God? Can you see the Lord in them? Can you see where he's active in their life? Do they have a strong marriage? It's so important because a strong marriage takes pressure off of them. They have, they have support at home. Here's a really big one, and I mean really big. Are they teachable and correctable? Because we have to be like that. Every one of us, from the main leader down to the newer leaders, to the older leaders, to brand, brand new people coming in. Are you teachable and correctable? What's a sign that somebody's not correctable or not teachable? Oh, you'll hear this in their conversation. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Or you might hear, but, yeah, but. Yeah, but instead of just listening and taking it in, it's hard to receive correction, isn't it? It just kind of hurts your feelings a little bit. But the Bible says wounds from a friend are better than kisses from an enemy. And it says it's a badge of honor 
to receive valid criticism. That's in Proverbs. It says in Hebrews, the ones the Lord loves, he chastens. If God doesn't ever correct you, are you sure you belong to God? And that's true. They have to be a team player. Can they really get along with the people around them? Can they support the people around them? Can they encourage? And then are they able to delegate responsibility? As I said before, not everybody's good at that, but you can teach people how. Remember I said they need to be teachable? They have to be. So as you look for these people, you begin to see them. What, what's your job now? Praying earnestly over them, allowing them to make mistakes and learn from them, and, don't, and they need to feel like, oh, she's going to be so mad at me, he's going to be so mad at me. No. They need to feel like it's a safe place to go and say, I really messed up. I need to know how to do this. And it's safe. Another thing is be sure you give them recognition and honor. Be sure you verbally praise them. Teach them how to get a vision of what God wants them to do. Teach them to know what's the purpose of what they're doing. Teach them how to have goals to reach so that they can see I'm moving forward. Teach them how to get creative ideas. God is so creative. He's so happy to give you new and creative ideas for an old job. So teach them how to pray and ask for that. And then teach them how to look in the Word of God and get a word that says, this is why I've called you to this job, so that when it gets so difficult and they want to quit, everybody wants to quit, they can't quit because God told them to do this job and they have to wait till God says, leave. Bye. See you next time. I'm Betty Swan with Pennies from Heaven. You know, this has just been the greatest thing. It keeps going and going. It's over $38,500 now in just two years. And folks, I just started with $3.04 all by myself. So I couldn't do this without you. And together, you and I have fed people in Africa, Mexico, Belarus, Vietnam, the Philippines, even in America in New Orleans, and with Navajo Indians. So there's a lot of hungry people in the world, and together we're feeding them with what America throws away. So send your pennies to Wells Fargo Bank, to the account of Pennies from Heaven, Amarillo, Texas, or Pennies from Heaven, Betty Swan Ministries, but send anything because we can feed a lot of people with just a little bit of money. Thank you. God bless you. Order your copy today from the GLC Bookstore by calling the number on your screen. Please include the program number when ordering.